Good afternoon, distinguished guests, faculty members, and dear students who are joining through Zoom. Education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. These resounding words by Nelson Mandela resonate deeply as we gather here today to honor the illustrious career of Professor Anurana Nayakkara as we celebrate his invaluable contributions to the University of Moratua, it is imperative that we recognize this, the significance of listening to his experiences garnered over four decades. His wisdom and insights accrued through years of dedication and service serve as a guiding light for all of us, illuminating the path toward continued progress and excellence in the field of engineering. Now it is my honor to invite Professor Chinta Jayasinghe, the head of the Department of Civil Engineering, who has been instrumental in supporting and organizing this important event to deliver the welcome speech. Over to you, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Pasindu. Good afternoon, everybody. Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, the deans of the faculties, heads of departments, esteemed colleagues, the industry professionals, and honored guests. It is with great pleasure and a profound sense of appreciation that we gather here today to celebrate the illustrious career and retirement of a true luminary in the field of civil engineering. We have come together to honor a professor whose contributions have not only enriched our academic community, but have also left an indelible mark on the world of infrastructure development, construction, and civil engineering. On behalf of Department of Civil Engineering, I extend a warm welcome to all of you. Throughout a career spanning four decades, Professor Anurana Nayakkara has not only imparted knowledge to countless students, but has also been an inspiration to all of us in the academic community. His passion for civil engineering, especially concrete technology, dedication to teaching, and commitment to research have set a standard that many aspire to achieve. We have been fortunate to witness the evolution of a scholar who has seamlessly blended the traditional principles of civil engineering with cutting edge research, pushing the boundaries of what is possible in our field. Professor Nanayakara has been an exceptional mentor, guiding and nurturing the talents of countless students who have gone on to make remarkable contributions themselves. The impact of his research and the expertise he has shared with us will continue to influence the field for generations to come. Today's retirement lecture is an opportunity to recognize and honor Professor Nanayakkara for his remarkable contributions to the world of civil engineering. It is also a chance to express our heartfelt gratitude for the impact he has had on our lives and the field as a whole. Once again, thank you for joining us today in celebrating the legacy of an extraordinary professor. Let us make this day a memorable one filled with gratitude, admiration, and most importantly, inspiration. Once again, welcome all, of, all those who join us in person and online as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your warm welcome. Your support and efforts in organizing this event are deeply appreciated. Now I would like to cordially invite Emeritus Professor Priyan Dias to the podium to introduce the speaker for this momentous occasion. Thank you. Thank you, Pasindu. Ladies and gentlemen, Although I would have taught Anurana Nanayakara as a young assistant lecturer as early as 1980, I first noticed this lanky young academic 
with a mop of unruly hair in 1990 at a farewell given by the Department of Civil Engineering to Dr. Vimal Samrasinghe and Drs. Kanaka and Tilaka Maam Pityarachi. This was at a restaurant called Alcatraz in Dehiwala. I'm not sure why they called it Alcatraz because Alcatraz is a high security prison of the Californian show. But anyway, I also noticed this attractive young lady by his side, none other than Dhammika Nanayakara, his wife. She is now an attractive young mm. grandmother. <laughs> Anura had just returned with a DN from the University of Tokyo, having worked on the then cutting edge high performance concrete technology under Professors Hajime Okamura, known as the father of self-compacting concrete, and Koichi Maikawa. At Morotua University, Anura gradually established himself as the leading concrete technologist in the country, with due respect, of course, to other concrete technologists in the room, carrying out innovative and cutting-edge research largely on concrete in the fresh state and at early ages, and also on concrete durability. Uh, to my mind, things like research on early age temperature rise, cold joints in concrete, and self-healing of early age cracking uh, are the things that stand out in my own mind. Along the way, he served as a consultant to the National Building Research Organization, whose uh, Director General we have here, which has led, among other things, to a patent for a highly permeable and energy-absorbing paving block made from polyester spandex fa fabric waste, and also a handbook on construction materials. And also, he was a consultant to the University of Sri Jayavodhanapura, where he is co-supervising three doctoral students with international collaboration. He was also chairman of the Sri Lanka Standards Institution's Sectoral Committee on Building and Construction Materials, where he contributed to the development of national standards relating to building materials, fittingly inheriting that mantle from Professor Raghu Chandrakirti. He was also a member of the Model Code Committee for Concrete in Asia, this was, of course, suspected by some of us to be a thinly veiled attempt by Tokyo University to control concrete practice in Asia. Anyway, through his career, he maintained and developed collaborations with many Japanese academics and also spent a sabbatical with Professor Nick Buenfeld at Imperial College in London. All of this was in addition to his teaching duties that covered concrete technology, structural mechanics, structural analysis, and the design of water retaining structures. While still a young academic staff member, he initiated the fabrication of innovative and inexpensive laboratory equipment that demonstrated the principles of structural mechanics and measured parameters relating to concrete durability. So a very versatile academic and I think a role model for many of the younger academics who would have seen him. Anura has a very inquiring mind highly focused on getting to the crux of things in order to arrive at conclusions based on fundamental physical processes. This has led to a prolific output of innovative research that involved novel experimental techniques based on creative theoretical hypotheses and supported by judicious numerical modeling. His research has been recognized by two presidential awards for scientific publication in addition to the many Morotua University awards he has won. He won the prestigious Anton Award for the best technical paper on water retaining infrastructure at the annual IESL sessions in 2006 and, the, and was co-author of the gold medal winning best paper at the annual sessions of the Society of Structural Engineering Sri Lanka in 2018. We have uh, both presidents of SSC and IESL here. Anura's forays into administration as head of department from 2013 to 2016 and also as head of ITUM for a short while in 2020, were characterized by selfless service and the creation of pleasant, stress-free stress -free work environments for all parties. I think he was quite keen that he, <laughs> he served in that kind of way. He was project manager for the relocation and development of the ITUM from 2015 to 2017 and continues to serve on its board of management. If I'm not mistaken, he, was, he has also been recently appointed to Columbia University's council, uh, but I need to confirm that. I, I think he told me that. I was fortunate to have shared some of Anura's research and consulting interests, notably on the use of offshore sand and fly ash in concrete mixers, 
and also on the in-situ investigation and defect diagnosis of concrete structures. And hence have had many stimulating conversations with him on some of the fundamental physical processes I have alluded to earlier. He was the concrete material specialist for the Colombo Lotus Tower and instrumental in ensuring that at least 25% of fly ash was used both for temperature control in the 3 meter thick tower foundation and the marine durability and concrete pumpability in the superstructure. He also investigated the pile cap cracking in the Southern Express, Expressway project, something that also brought Nick Buenfeld to Sri Lanka, since the rather rare delayed ettring guide formation was suspected. I was also very happy to have been the research supervisor for Anura and Dhammika's son Kushan in his final year undergraduate program, and happier still to have published research with him as I had with his father. I hope that Anura will continue to contribute to the construction industry, in particular through research and consulting, a glimpse of which we are about to enjoy. And since I have the podium now, I will take this opportunity to wish him and his family the best of health and much happiness. Before I leave, it is said that concrete technologies, technologists are all mixed up and set in their ways. But of course, those who work in flowing concrete are a bit different because their ideas flow into your, our brains and get self-compacted there. Anur. Thank you very much, Priyan, for your kind words and going into very fine details huh, about me. Okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone, and really happy that you are attending in person, and also there are many people who are joining online. So thank you very much for taking time to attend my last lecture, despite your busy schedule. I think those who have listened to my lectures know that normally I exceed my allocated time. And the chairman tried to stop me, but today I don't think that no one tried to stop me because this is my last lecture. So it is a challenging task to present several decades of uh, research on different topics in field of concrete while maintaining connectivity. I always when I'm making a presentation, always make sure that there is a connectivity between two slides. But here it is very, very difficult to, you know, have that connection because I'm going to talk about what I did over maybe last 30 years after my PhD. <clears throat> so I thought of, you know, there are two options I had. One is to arrange those in chronological order or arrange based on the, the properties of concrete. So I thought of the hybrid version is the best. The, so I will start with the, uh, okay, right. This is my first slide, the four decades of my academic journey from 1982 to 2023. So if you just one month ago, I retired officially. So entered in 1997 to Katubenda campus. It was known as Katubenda campus at that time, University of Sri Lanka, and passed out in 1982 and as an assistant lecturer in the same year. Then in 1985, I got the Monbusha scholarship and went to Japan for my higher studies. Rest, I think you all know got my degree, MEng in 97, de-engineering, Doctor of Engineering in 1990, and returned on the same year soon after uh, obtaining my PhD, or they call it Doctor of Engineering. Then became a professor in 2006, and 2014, I was promoted to senior professor, and September 2023, I retired from the active service from the University of Moratua. Okay, so 
I will uh, start my research from this point, that is, as a graduate student of Department of Civil Engineering, University of Tokyo. So I was there from 85 to 90, and my professors were Professor Okamura and Professor Maikawa, as Priyan mentioned. They were doing a research on constitutive modeling of hardened concrete, and newly formed group is the fresh concrete group. And Professor Okamura has uh, proposed several topics in 1985 where I, uh, I entered to University of Tokyo. And in our fresh concrete group, now he's a professor, Ozawa, and Somnuk is from Thailand. He's also a professor at Tamasat University. And myself, I put my name there because I don't think that anyone can recognize he has me. So, so there are three topics that we took. I took the computational model for pumpability of concrete. There's a story behind that one. I, I don't take, I mean, I don't want to take time for that one. And modeling of quasi-static behavior of fresh concrete by Somnuk. And the Ozawa took the challenge of development of high-performance concrete. That is the one PhD topic given by Professor Kamura. So, with respect to my topic, the computational model for pumpability concrete, as you all can hear, all these research projects try to solve a problem, industry problems. So, now, even you all know that when you're pumping concrete, the most common problem is blocking, blocking in tapered or blocking in bifurcation. We don't have much of bifurcation there. So a lot of bifurcation, I mean, uh, pipe layouts are there. And also in bends. So now objective of my research is to predict the pumpability. What do you mean by predict the pumpability is to predict the pressure required to pump a particular concrete. And also the risk of blocking for a given concrete. Now this is a very new area and the approach was first we wanted to visualize the flow of aggregate in a pipeline. As you all know you can't see the movement of aggregate in a, a pipeline when the concrete is pumping. So one research student, a doctoral student, again he uh, is a student of Professor Okamura, he was working on what you call model concrete. Now model concrete is, consists of transparent polymer, that is polymer is, uh, our, uh, is the one that we use in the pampas or diapers, when you add water, it is a super absorbent polymer. When you add water, it expands and it becomes a paste. And he was using that one again to study the same uh, uh, area, the blocking of concrete in a pipeline. So he was using a transparent perspex pipe and this model mortar and the lightweight aggregate and since it is a transparent pipeline you can see the movement but really it is messy to observe exact movement. Then I said that okay, I mean since we are modeling concrete, why not the flow also we must model it. So instead of uh, lightweight aggregate, I propose, okay, we go for plastic bowls. 
to model the aggregate as plastic balls and then not a pipeline but a section of a pipe, 2D flow pattern. So that simplify lot of difficulties the original researcher had. Okay, so flow visualization was the starting point of this research. So flow visualization, you see model concrete. Now you can see here how the plastic balls in the model mortar or paste moving in a tapered section. So you can see at one point the plastic balls make an arch of particles. But if you use lightweight aggregate you can see that it forms the arch and prevent the flow of concrete beyond that point. Now it is not only this one, each and every particle movement was traced by taking a video camera, right? So capture the particle movement of the uh, plastic balls and then later those movements were analyzed using a digital digitizer and we got this kind of flow line pattern. So this one we did for the bifurcation, tapered pipe as well as the, the, the bent pipes. Now this is, looks, I mean, interesting and easy to understand, right? The, now I always use this slide when I am doing the explaining the cracking due to settlement of fresh concrete, right? The same thing we observe with this bottle concrete, right? Now if you think about the movement of concrete in a tapered section or the column head, there's a possibility of cracking at this point due to the settlement of concrete once the arch, is, arch of aggregate is formed. So like this one. Okay, now I cannot, I couldn't, you know, stop at that point. It is just the beginning of a hard work over five years. The, the hardest part is doing the concrete pumping test with actual fresh concrete. That is the aim, right? So there was a laboratory type a concrete pump, laboratory type concrete pump, and I have to carry out pumping test for th these three different sections, tapered, two different tapered uh, uh, pipes and also bent pipe. The so, when I check the pressure with respect to slump, you can see that here there is no correlation at all. The, there is no correlation at all, as expected. Right? So, therefore, to explain the variation of pump with, ref, with respect to different mixed proportions of concrete, we introduce different parameters. Even now, when I am analyzing fresh concrete, I use those parameters. That is the concentration of coarse aggregate, concentration of sand aggregate by volume. Because the volume concentration is the one that decides the, the movement, one that decides the deformation. So when you convert the mixed proportion with respect to those parameters, we could see a good relationship with total pressure. Now, 
This is just the experimental results. You know that I cannot stop at this point. Now I have to simulate this one. I have to simulate this and develop a model to predict this. So by doing experiment, we will not end your research and show that, okay, this is the behavior. No, we have to uh, come up with a model so that it can be applied to any kind of concrete, right? So I don't think that you are interested to know about that. I'm also not going to explain, don't worry. This is the, just to give the... Uh, complicate, I mean the complication of this model, these are the equations, governing equations, right? So it was a multi-phase model for pipe flow of concrete. Four phases were considered, gravel, sand, powder and water. For each phase you write the governing equation. As I said, I am not going to explain those and stress of each phase was calculated. So the aggregate sand and the pressure of the paste phase and the total pressure with addition of uh, all three stressors. And I have to introduce material model for the stiffnesses of aggregate with respect to the concentration uh, of coarse aggregate or the gravel and the uh, sand. So, finally, the I managed to model it and predict the pressure I measured based on the model that we have developed. So, this is just a one a graph, there were so many and the final outcome is this, the predicted and the actual. So you can see the good correlation. Okay. In summary, in two slides, that is the work I did for mainly five years. Uh, so, and presented First presentation was at the third international symposium on liquid solid force organized by American Society of Mechanical Engineers, winter session at, in Chicago, and all attended. Myself, I have to mention that, right? Myself, uh, he is the one who introduced this model concrete, Professor ha Hashimoto, and my supervisor, I think the, ah, uh, yes, Okamo, uh, Professor Maikawa, and the Professor Ozawa, rest uh, uh, not related to us. Okay, so the two. <laughs> presented the papers in this and we all three did the research together. It is not a single person. We work as a group and all contributed to all three projects. Right. Now the outcome of this one, not only the development of the this computation model, the development of so-called high-performance concrete. That was the original name given by the Professor Okamura. So that was pro proposed in 1986. The, the title of the PhD research topic was Development of High-Performance Concrete. Again, as I said earlier, there's a background to this one. Why he proposed this one? Now, as you all know, all civil engineers, practicing engineers, durability of concrete depends on the permeability of concrete and the permeability depends on the porosity. The porosity consists of the entrapper and the uh, capillary pores. 
Now, the capillary pores you can control by controlling the water cement ratio, reduce the water cement ratio, you can reduce the capillary pores. But intra you have to compact it. For that one, you need skilled people. During that time, they are short of skilled people in Japan. So they want to replace skilled people and come up with a concrete where you don't require skilled people to place the concrete. So that was the idea to introduce self-compacting concrete to eliminate that factor, the human factor. So you can just pour the concrete and that concrete will fall, flow into the each and every corner of the the form work and fill it and you get uniformity in quality of concrete. So that is the starting point. And uh, the, the first mix was produced in 1988 at Tokyo University. Once they developed something they demonstrate that to the construction industry. It was a big show and this uh, Ozawa is looking at how the self-compacting concrete is flowing in the very congested uh, pre-stress, pre-cast beam sections form work made out of transparent sheet. So, the later this name was change from HPC to self-compacting concrete because high-performance concrete meaning something else. It, uh, not the uh, self-compactability but the durability as well. So that is, I am happy that my research also contribute to the development of self-compacting concrete. The so, now this is the point that I want to stress. Innovative thinking has led to a groundbreaking innovation or invention, the self-compacting concrete. A simple idea, but that changed the whole construction industry. This idea was gripped by the Europe. It is like, I mean, the standard concrete in Europe because it is more environmental friendly, not making much of a noise, right? So the oops, oh, sorry. So these are the examples of self-compacting concrete uh, used in Japan. Akashi Kaigyo Bridge is the longest suspension bridge and they have used self-compacting concrete there. And there are, and this is the, the Yokohama Tower. They have used the self-compacting concrete and even in very complicated the advantage is for this kind of structures. Okay, now that is my, the beginning of the my journey as a researcher in concrete technology. So I said that, okay, I'm going to arrange my research topics in a, in a more mixed manner. So, so now I have explained to you what I did for the PhD. So I returned in 1990 and assumed duties, resumed duties as senior lecturer and went up to the academic ladder. So during this time, I did a lot of research, especially in concrete and few in masonry. So I thought of arranging my research in this order, starting from materials, then the evaluation of fresh concrete and early age concrete and hardened concrete where you talk about the strength and durability. So start with the 
first one the alternative materials for concrete there are two materials that uh, uh, I considered in my research one is the river sand alternate right when you look at this graph you can realize or you can see the the problem with the river sand the crisis sand crisis in Sri Lanka the price of river sand is skyrocketing right when you compare with the cement of course it is increasing but not like river sand so this was predicted in early 90s and the the first sand study national study was carried out in 1992 national sand study phase 1 then in 1995 there was a chorus industry study funded by world bank i suppose uh, that is also a very useful one but those recommendations were never implemented then in 1999 interim sand study was carried out professor priyan dais is the one proposed this one and he kindly invite me to join this research project Thank you, Priyan, for inviting me and getting involved in this project. Because later on, I continue in this line, right? Because of the opportunity you gave me. So, so both of us got involved in this one as well. The coastal resources man under coastal resources management project. Again, we studied. River sand alternate to that was in 2002, and in 2006, uh, National Policy on Sand as a Resource for Construction Industry was published by the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources. And if you refer that one, you can find some of the things that we have. Uh, recommended are given in that especially with respect to offshore sand so the then in 2014 recommendation for alternative for river sand in construction a policy document a policy initiative was prepared by CEDA and so even though there are so many recommendations so many suggestions those were not fully implemented you can see there's no change in the trend of uh, price increase there's no tr change in the trend so this is in 2018 i don't know the price now maybe in this range okay so in our interim sands study we consider several river sand alternatives one is land based sand or pit sand dune sand offshore sand and manufactured sand now if you take the pit sand this picture itself shows the impact of land based sand I don't think even though those days when we are doing this one we considered but red lawn we thought that we should not uh, encourage this land base and because of the to solve one environment problem we are creating another environment problem the so you can see that the the damage people have done creating a huge reservoir so the next one is the dune sand so we have went to the 
Futlam area, Navakadu, that area, and collected dune sand samples, right? That area, you get a lot of huge dunes, sand dunes. In Sri Lanka, we have this dunes along the, the northwest, southeast, and the northeast. So a lot of dunes are there. So these dunes are natural protection to the coastline. You know what happened during tsunami time? So to get the better view, people have removed these dunes and the tsunami entered the land through that. So dune is a natural protection for the erosion of uh, coastline. So we should not touch the dunes. When I presented this one in an international conference which was held in Cut, I think both of us attended that one. And when I presented that one, okay, we are considering dune sand. One Japanese guy stand up and ask, we never touch dunes. We never touch dunes. I said that, no, we are touching only the top part. <laughs> so that is to escape uh, because they know that the importance of that, right? How sensitive that was. So then the most promising one is the offshore sand. The, as I mentioned, the, in the national sand, uh, uh, national policy on sand as resource for construction industry, there's a one section, the call activities to be promoted. Activities to be promoted, the one activity is offshore sand. So according to a national policy, the government is for promoting offshore sand offshore sand. The, so they have, so offshore sand is deep sea sand deposits. The depth should be more than 15 meters according to this uh, guideline. And it is different to the beach sand. So you cannot touch the beach sand and the concentration of chloride is very much higher than the offshore sand. So the, the extraction is a, uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about that one, is uh, because time is precious. The, now the National uh, Sri Lanka Land Recommendation Corporation is doing this one, getting the approval land bridging and processing. So people are worried about use of offshore sand, right? Now if you think about when you inquire about the use of offshore sand in other countries, especially UK, for anything and everything, that we check what the UK is doing, because we are following the UK standard. So they are using not only sand, they are using sea dredge, uh, gravel as well for major civil engineering construction work. So why we have to worry about this? There are three things that people have concern. One is the grading, it is a variable, we cannot get... Now that is true with the reverse end, the grading can vary from very fine to very coarse, depending on the uh, season. And the shells in the offshore cell. The large ones you can see it and remove it, but if there are fine shell fragments, we cannot see it. We have to use offshore sand with the, these shell fragments. The most worrying thing is this soil contamination. That is the most worrying. 
So, because that can lead to corrosion of reinforcement, white deposit on the surface, and the deterioration of the structures. Okay, so we did a uh, lot of studies, collected samples from different places. Now, this is the initial one during the interim uh, uh, sand study. And the the grading, when you check the grading, it is in the fine to medium range, right? Not coarse, right? Not coarse, fine to medium range. And the very fines in the, that is less than 63 microns, very, very small, right? The limit is 3%, it is much less than that one. So this is fine, right? The and when you look at the shape of the particle, I think some of you have seen this one earlier, those who have seen this one earlier know what it is. The one is more rounded and smooth, other one is not so rounded and not so smooth. So people think the one below is the offshore sand, the upper one is the river sand, it is the other way around. The offshore sand is much more smoother and rounded because it has traveled a long distance. It has traveled a long distance due to wear and tear. Uh, it has become much more rounded and you know the advantage of that kind of shape, right? So it can improve the workability. It can improve the workability. Okay. So, but the problem with this one is the shell fragments, right? You can see these white deposits, particles, the small particles, shell fragments are there. And when you check, if you check the, the standard, the B is old one, there is no limit given for the uh, fine aggregate, but there is a limit given for the limit for shell, for cos aggregate. Even in the latest European standard, there is no limits. What we have to do is we have to declare, right? We have to declare, okay, the shell content for coarse particles is in this range, C10 or whatever the value. And the other one, there is no requirement, right? So, but we have a SLS standard and there we set the limit to not no limit but less than 15 percent at that time so we thought based on the the test results 15 is a acceptable figure so the the large shells we can easily remove the CLRDC is selling this one, right? Not only sand they are selling, they are selling the shells extracted or sieve from the offshore sand so to produce lime. And the shell content in the offshore sand they are dredging now, though this is the earlier one, they are dredging now is very, very small, right? So it is in this range, right? It is in this range. So it is not a big issue, uh, shells present in the offshore sand, it's not a big issue. It will not impair the strength or the permeability because of the smoothness, even though these are flood particles, even this is an enlarged view, is an enlarged view. Uh, th these are very small particles and when it is coated with paste, so that will compensate the the loss of workability due to flatness. Right. Okay, so the, the most uh, uh, the troublesome factor here is the chloride content. Now if you wash it, you can remove the chloride. There are limits given in the European standard as the standard for the Aggregate EN standard is the standard for concrete, the European standard, latest one. So, 
So these are the standards, uh, the limits given for the maximum chloride content. Coarse aggregate, there is no limit specified. Fine aggregate, the guidance limit is there, guidance limit is there, that is not compulsory, but the, the requirement is for the concrete, it is not for the aggregate. So, in SLS standard for fine aggregate, we set to a very low value, that is to build up the confidence of the use of offshore sand to promote that one, 0 0.01, right? That is very, very small value. So, in our interim sand study, we try to simulate the washing of offshore sand by natural rain and to simulate that one we constructed this what you call sand column these are sampling points and so we put the water sprinkle water here correspond to minimum and maximum rainfall in that area the Mutarajavela and we found that with the maximum rainfall can remove the chloride entirely. But there is a problem here. The bottom one, uh, the some retention of the sea water. We found some retention of sea water at the bottom part. So when people uh, saw this one, I can remember engineer Karunaradna was very, very critical about this one. So he asked if he take the one from the bottom, what will happen? Uh, we cannot make sure that the fellow will take the sand from the top. So finally, we end up with the recommendation of washing, sieving and washing. That is the safest thing. The, so the land recommendation is doing that part. I will skip this one because uh, the other one is the performance of wash. The offshore sand in replacing sand, uh, river sand, the you can see here the improvement in the compressive strength and also the workability because of the roundness. So the other one is the comparing that one with the MSAN. The MSAN is having very high fineness and the offshore sand is very small fine particle. And the good combination is M sand and river sand. So you compensate the negatives and positive points. So M sand is having fine fraction which will improve the cohesiveness, but because of this rust surface, it will reduce the workability. But this one is having a very smooth surface that will improve the workability, right? But the offshore sand is not having fine fraction to improve the cohesiveness. So one can uh, blend these two and achieve a very good workable and economical mix, right? So this study we did at a batch implant, sunken batch implant, and we found that you can save money, you can save cement, you can save the admixture and finally you can make a profit out of it if you use offshore sand. Now the problem is why people are not going for that one, right? This is a study carried out by uh, the MPhil student from Jawadhanapura for his MPhil uh, research project, Brenavan supervised by uh, Professor Kanta Singh is here. 
So here it shows that the, the number of contractors, the number of contractors use reverse hand. So you can see that lot of people use reverse hand for residential building construction. Only the high-rise buildings use MSA. Even though there is a huge price difference, there is huge price difference, still people tend to go for the reverse air because of the misconceptions, because of the misconceptions. Okay, then the next one is manufactured sand. So that is, I am presenting mainly the work done by Brennan for his field research. Now this is a very good information, those who are in the construction industry. The common rock types available in Sri Lanka. So if you look at this graph, you can see that the Chanakite is the most commonly available rock type to produce aggregate. Not only the coarse aggregate, even the MSA. The next one is the uh, horn blade. Nice. So these are the two main rock types available in Sri Lanka for suitable ones. There are a lo lot of rock types, but suitable for the uh, production of coarse and fine aggregate. Now the as this is the same. Uh, slide, right? The demand for M sand is not very high. Demand for M sand is not very high. Demand is for the uh, river sand because people find that the M to work with M sand is difficult. The masons don't like because of this rough surface. So we have to come up with the innovative ways of using this MSAD for masonry work. I think the, the construction industry, especially the ready mix suppliers have mastered the use of MSAD for ready mix concrete. I don't think that they are using river sand anymore. So they have mastered it because they have the people, the technical backup is there, but for house builders it is difficult. So the solution to this one should be the pre-pack plaster mix. Pre-pack plaster mix can solve this problem. So what you get is like ready mix concrete, dry mix, so those who are building, uh, house builders can just add water and do the whatever they were. So in this study he mainly focused on the effect of fine particles on properties, especially if properties on properties of fresh concrete, higher the fine fraction you can see that bleeding is reduces. There are positive and negative aspects. When the bleeding reduces, the positive aspect of more fine means it becomes a very cohesive. And bleeding reduces mean there is a t high tendency to occur plastic shrinkage cracking because there is no water layer. Unless you, unless you start curing at very early stage. So you can overcome that problem by starting the curing 
at very early stage, as soon as the sheen disappears. Because having high content, not very high content, a moderate content of ultra-fine particles improve the cohesiveness, that means the segregation resistance of the concrete. That is a positive aspect of ultra-fine particles, right? So, now this graph also shows the, the plastic shrinkage crack initiation time. So, when the fine content is high, it quickly cracks. But there is a solution for that one. So, you have to start curing as soon as possible. Okay, yes. The published so many papers in journals. Uh, the second one is use of industrial waste in concrete. Now this slide shows the 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 waste coming from the coal-fired thermal power plants. There are two waste materials. One is fly ash, other one is butter mash. I think all the cement companies use the entire uh, fly ash coming out from the Norochole power plants. So now they don't have. So because of the shutdown and the Bottom mesh, until recently, no one tried to use this bottom mesh. So this is a porous particle, coarse particles, not as fine as this one. It is the particles collected from the bottom of the boiler. That is why it is called bottom mesh. So the this is the quantity of butter mash and fly ash you get from each power plant. There are three 300 megawatt power plants at Norochole. So these are not waste material. Even the butter mash is not a waste material. The, now the main concern with the butter mash is the heavy metal and risk of radiological hazards. When you have the heavy metals, people think that that can lead to uh, health problems. Right? So when you check the, the, the heavy metals in the bottom mesh, we found that all are within the allowable limits specified by the, the EPA in US, Environmental Protection Agency in US. So, and if you use the bottom ash with the cement, these, all these heavy metals get encapsulated with the cement paste and that will prevent the leaching out. That is the best way of using the materials with heavy metals. So, this is bottom mesh can be considered as a lightweight aggregate and Dr. Aziri is here. I think we, I think about maybe 10 years ago, I cannot remember exactly, we visited Norochole and with the NBRO, Dr. Aziri and other researchers at NBRO and I made a presentation to the CEB people regarding the use of this bottom mesh and the fly ash. And the, the risk of just dumping of bottom mesh in open ash pond. Because at that time there was no idea of using the bottom mesh. 
and fly ash they had the plans with the cement manufacturers to take the entire uh, output of the fly ash but not for the butter mash the only thing they had was the ash pond to dump it there so we volunteered and did research to produce what you a lightweight cement block that is the simplest thing that we have been we could do and we produce lightweight cement blocks and uh, when you this was the MSc project by Savita she is working at NBRO as a research engineer and Ms. Sunetra also contributed to this one so we found that the properties are matching with the strength requirements and other properties specified in the SLA standard. And we check the radioactivity of the product itself and we found that there is no risk of rheological hazard. So that was the first one on bottom ash. People have done a lot of work on the fly ash, so, so I am not going to touch on that one. The recently, we tried to use water mash to produce foam concrete and geopolymer concrete, both are final year projects, so we couldn't go into very deep. So we managed to produce foam concrete having a very low uh, density and reasonable strength which can be used for uh, building construction. And bottom mesh based geopolymer, the aim was to now in geopolymer you have to heat cure to get the strength. Geopolymer is a mixture of fly ash or silica sauce, strong alkali base sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide and sodium silicate and if you heat it uh, you can get very high strength within one or two days. So heat curing is a problem if you want to use this in in situ concrete. So if you want to promote this one for in situ concrete, the strength development should take place at the ambient temperature. So apart from the bottom ash, we use slag, ground granulated blast furnace slag, and we got a reasonable strength. But since it's a final, project, final year project, we couldn't do much uh, study on this one. And we wanted to do research on this area more. And the development of the next is the development of the mechanically activated coal-fired bottom mash base geopolymers. Now this was initiated by Dr. Harsha Suryarachi from Rona University. I think he is here. He is here with uh, thank you for Harsha attending this one in person from all the way from uh, Gaul. So he is the main supervisor and the Kalinda from INSI. Now he is a doctoral student registered at Ruhuda. So I am pushing him to complete this one. It's a very, very, you know, attractive and very useful project. So it is an ongoing project, right? It's an ongoing project. So to produce Geopolymer, what you require is a 
aluminosilicate source there are so many so many but the bottom ash can be used as a aluminosilicate source and that you have to mix with sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide and sodium silicate solution either sodium or potassium silicate and do the heat treatment it can vary from 50 to 100 degrees so the the product is called geopolymer now if you mix with coarse aggregate and fine aggregate you get geopolymer concrete not before hardening but in the paste phase we have to mix the aggregate like in the normal concrete now what do you mean by mechanically activated I mean when I first heard this mechanical activate I asked Harsh what is it by mechanically activated no sir it is just a grinding right the so you activate the very coarse particles by grinding to a very fine fraction very close to the cement fineness very close to the cement fineness right so that is the easiest way of you know making it reactive of course there are so many other things are there the amorphous silica is the one that main one in the fly ash but you don't get that much of amorphous silica in water mesh but once you grind it to a finer fraction then the reaction will take place much more quickly so you can see here the 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 fineness of butter mash and fly ash very close once you grind it once you grind it so so we, now if you, are, if you want to study concrete with innovative binding material you don't straight away jumping to the concrete first you have to study the paste phase itself and see the behavior of that one then you slowly one by one you add sand mortar phase and then concrete so the same approach that we use here to study the 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 reaction of water mash with the other chemicals that we mix sodium silicate sodium hydroxide first we have to understand that one whether we are getting the geopolymer or something else we are, whether we are getting a geopolymer or something else so we did investigate the paste phase first right that is to assess the the react, uh, reaction mechanism of geopolymer right reaction mechanism so then the add sand phase to assess the compressive strength sulfate resistance shrinkage and the optimum proportion of alkali activator to bound binder ratio and sodium silicate sodium hydroxide the optimum ratio and the end we studied the properties of concrete right so presentation i am not going to present the details that is the kalinder's job so what i i will show you is the outcome of some of his research findings right the first one is the acid resistance of different water mass base geopolymer as you can see this you can see that the very high resistance against acid attack with the increase of curing period you can see that the resistance increases and the concrete totally disintegrate totally disintegrate right 
The other one is the sulfate resistance. Sulfate resistance also showed the similar behavior. Normal OPC samples, when normal OPC samples disintegrate, the geopolymer samples showed very good resistance against sulfate attack. This is, this is the key point in geopolymer, key point in the, the, the durability aspects of geopolymer. So it's a superior uh, in resisting the sulfate attack and the acid attack. Okay, so then the recent one, utilization of textile waste in manufacturing of paving blocks applicable for outdoor sports services. Now this top title came much, much later. Much, much later, right? Now that is how you carry out, do research. You don't come up with the well-defined research topic. You can't do that because you are doing research. You don't know where it end up with, right? So the, the, the starting point was when the MS requested that from the NBRO find a solution to use this waste material. The use of offshore sand as an alternative to river sand, cut, the use of fires and concrete, both to utilize a waste material it, so and to improve concrete that. durability, and the mitigation of plastic shrinkage cracking solution. in ready-mixed concrete pores have all been driven by... It's a highly stretchable material. It is mainly used to, uh, uh, for uh, sportswear. So, we thought that the best way is to try to use, to produce paving blocks. And like, as like in the geopolymer, here also we started with paste phase. We started with paste phase rather than going for mortar phase. We started with paste phase and checked the flexural strength and the compressive strength of mortar, sorry, paste with Textile waste, textile waste means spandex waste. And we did a lot of things, shredding to a different fractions, right? And we found that there's an optimum percentage, the volume percentage, that will give the highest flexural strength and compressive strength. So if we use that percentage to produce you know, blocks. Now, this is the failure pattern of the paste phase. The Maheshi attached to the NBRO, this was his, her MSc research project. So she came and showed me, sir, we can't get the brittle failure. There's no brittle failure. I don't know what to do. So I said, that don't get panic. We'll see. Uh, so what we can do with that property? So there's no brittle failure. That is also good, right? The so she changed the she optimized the mix. She optimized the mix and produced paving blocks. And there also she got this kind of deformation pattern. There is no clear fracture. There is no clear fracture. The block is getting compressed. Block is getting compressed. So how to define the failure? So I propose this one. You change the uh, change of the gradient of the load deformation curve. That is why the change from the elastic to plastic behaving. So you change that one. You take that as your failure load. Right? So now the then the compressive strength 
with the increase now fix the percentage of the textile waste spandex the cement water cement ratio was fixed and the, the parameter uh, the next parameter was the sand content now here we use m sand so with the, obviously with the increase of m sand the strength reduces so got the limiting value satisfying the minimum compressive strength requirement right then evaluated the uh, properties of that optimum mix right and the i think i think it looks like that i mean i'm going to exceed the time limit <laughs> uh, so I will just quickly go, go through this one the uh, we pro we pro pro propose I mean we, 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 we evaluate the other properties also and the most interesting one is the two properties that this block is possessing one is the permeability now if you get a very high permeability in a conventional mix you consider as a fail huh? you consider that block is failed to satisfy the requirement no that should be the other way around the the blocks or paving blocks that we use for paving the footpath or whatever the area should allow rainwater to penetrate and infiltrate into the ground table. So this is having very high uh, infiltration, the permeability. So a conventional one is having very, very low and this is having very high permeability. The next one is the shock absorption effect. So, the Maheshi came up with this standard and found there's a standard for the sports surfaces where the shock absorbs and requirement is specified. And there was a test method specified and we fabricated that one and measured the, the shock absorption and we found that it is within the required limit and if you check the convention one it is zero no shock absorption and this one satisfy the requirement okay so this was used for a test track and evaluated and all the properties are satisfying and then BRO got the patent for this product. Okay, now it comes to the next topic, the evaluation and specification of fresh concrete. So we have just finished the materials. Now we have come to the fresh concrete. Still at very early stage of the concrete. Initial setting time. The you know the importance of initial setting time, you should finish mixing, transporting and placing before the elapse of initial setting time. And how do you evaluate the initial setting time? So there is a STM test method. What you do is you measure the penetration resistance and when the penetration resistance is equal to 3.5, megapascal so the time elapsed from the water you add to the time you receive the that penetration is, is considered as a 
initial setting time. So a 3.5 limit is specified in ASDL. If you measure the initial setting time based on this definition, you will see a very long time as the initial setting time. Practically, you cannot place the concrete uh, based on the time you evaluate based on this specification. Now, according to this one, initial setting time is six hours, but the slump won't be there to place the concrete, right? So, we have carried out several research, uh, two final year, two or three final year research project and one MSc research project with Saitama University and again because of the time limitation I am not going to details. So we found that this 3.5 limit is not practicable. It will give a completely unrealistic time. So this one shows that very clearly. The resistance is in the range of 0 0.6 and 0 0.5 and the slump is around some is 0 and 10. You cannot place the concrete. So this is not uh, the practical, I mean it is not practically you can use it this uh, method of obtaining the. So then the revibration. Now the revibration is, we tried revibration to see whether you can bring back the fluidity of the concrete within that initial sitting time period. So you can see here when the revibration within the initial, so called initial sitting time based on the STM leads to traces, that means you cannot use uh, this kind of concrete, uh, that means it has already passed the initial sitting time period. So this is the final year project that we have carried out to measure the shear resistance and evaluate the efficiency of the cold joint. So the 3.5 is cannot be acceptable and I think Japanese specification is 0.5 Newton per millimeter squared for uh, the initial setting time. What I'm saying is not even that, you have to go for zero. This is the time when the resistance start to increase. But there's a very simple test that we can do at the site. Just insert the poker vibrator into the fresh concrete and if you can take it out, without leaving a trace, that means you are still within the initial setting type period. That is the simplest test. You can carry out under site condition. That is very, very important, site conditions. No point doing something in the laboratory. Then the tensile strain capacity. So, now, this is important for plastic shrinkage cracking. Now, this graph shows how the tensile strength or tensile strength capacity varies with time and the strength development of the concrete. Right? When the tensile strength, uh, the, the tens tensile strain exceeds the tensile strength, concrete cracks. Now, the this is the graph you can find in literature. The variation of tensile strain capacity with respect to the age, right? With respect to age. So the results are for uh, age more than six hours. But the plastic shrinkage cracking taking place within six hours, third to uh, 
six hours. So there we don't have results to find out what is the tensile strain capacity in plastic state. Why those results are not there? Because very difficult to evaluate eh? tensile strain capacity of the fresh concrete, right? So the challenges face during the development of this eh, tensile strain capacity. One is the strain should be applied to a fresh concrete. So your mold should be deformable. And then the strain measurements, you cannot uh, use any the DMEC points or strain meters. We have to do a non-contactable strain measuring methods. So we developed this one Pasindu's uh, MSc project was that, now he is a senior lecturer, Dr. Pasindu Veera Singha, he is the one who is compare, comparing. Uh, so this is what we did, right? So we record the movement of the deformation by keeping uh, markers on the surface and measure the strains by image analysis. And this is the result we got. So this can be used to study the, the strain capacity of different uh, mixed proportions. Then the evaluation of pumpability. I did a more theoretical study and this one is more practical one. This was done by Ms. Dilini. Now she is in UK. She completed this PhD. This one she did for this uh, MSc project. That again, a long time ago, two things that we want to find out to establish the model to predict the concrete pumping pressure at construction site from the rheological properties of concrete and identify the correlation between the rheological properties of concrete and the mixed proportion. So this is a massive task. This was carried out in Luna Tower so sunk in construction kindly agreed to use the, the concrete pumping pipeline to do this one. And we place pressure transducers to monitor the radial pressure and attach strain gauges to monitor the pressure variation along the pipeline. And because the pumping speed is very high, you need a data logger. Kindly, Harsha gave their data logger. And all the instruments or the pressure gauges was given by Professor Azomoto. So we managed to carry out this pumping test successfully and we came up with very important conclusion, the most important one during pumping flow of saturated concrete, radial pressure and the longitudinal pressure are more or less equal. Then the, this is a, again ongoing research project, is an image research project the uh, task was given to Nalini attached to uh, Sunken Overseas. Now this is, a, I suppose, issue in the construction industry. What should be the appropriate fresh 
concrete temperature we should specify. There are so many specifications. So I think the approach should be like this. For mass concrete, yes, we have to control the fresh concrete. But for no, any other concrete, you don't need to lower the temperature to a very low value, right? So, so when you look at the specifications in national standards, you can see here it varies from 38, from 30 to 38. Even in ICTAD, it specifies 38. I, I don't know it, why they came up with 38. And all BS specified 30. And EN, there is no limit. Uh, says only greater than 35. And BS 850 is 35. So, we want to study this one. Right? Effect of fresh concrete temperature on the uh, fresh and hardened concrete properties under hot weather condition. So, this was a very interesting result. The cracking, the plastic shrinkage cracking was monitored. By changing the fresh concrete temperature, we could reduce the fresh concrete temperature to very low value, but the lowest we could achieve was the, the 30 and we went up the maximum was uh, 36. So the important thing you can uh, extract from this one is there is an optimum temperature at which you get the maximum compressive strength and lowest the the tendency to crack, the, the maximum crack width is lowest at this point. Now this is 34, it is close to the ambient temperature. And the flow rate, evaporation rate is also minimum when it is close to ambient. So the conclusion is you don't need to reduce the fresh concrete temperature below ambient temperature. We have to do more test on this one, but with the limited test results available, the conclusion is you don't need to reduce your fresh concrete temperature below the ambient one. Then, strength rise prediction, So this was a M-field project and why we started this one, right? You know that to design the reinforcement to control cracking at early age, we should know the T1 and T2. T1 is the temperature drop from hydration peak to the ambient and T2 is the subsequent temperature variation. So now in BS8, Dot, dot seven you can you can find this table and that gives uh, t1 values for different wall thicknesses and different the cement contents and different types of uh, form work now 2016 long time ago and it was not uh, the euro code was also not practiced even the euro code you cannot find this one right so and here in the note it says these values are valid when the placing temperature i think the, fifth, uh, the placing temperature around 20 and fresh concrete temperature is uh, about 15 so if you take, consider local condition, it's quite different. It's quite different. So how we can modify this one? Can we use as it is? Or we have to increase because 
So our, our ambient temperature is much higher, fresh concrete temperature is also much higher, the reaction must be fast, so we should get much higher values of this one, much higher than the value specified here. So this is how it was started. So this temperature rise depends on so many factors. So we use the, again, I am not going to details of this one, we use a hydration model developed by the Professor Maikawa and it is a multi-component uh, model where you can input the chemical composition of the cement and the mixture portion and then you can get the, the temperature rise. Eh? Heat of hydration, you can get the heat of hydration and corresponding temperature rise if you feed that into the finite element model, right? So thermal analysis done by FEM. So based on this one, the, after calibrating it, we came up with this table. We reproduced the table given in BS8007. We can see not big difference, not big difference, right? Even though the temperature is very high, not big difference for local materials feeding the chemical composition, typical composition and the local environment conditions, we came up with this proportion. Okay, so T2 is again the subsequent temperature drop. So for that one also we proposed by analyzing the temperature variation throughout the year at different locations. So T2 is defined as the difference between mean ambient temperature and minimum temperature, average minimum temperature over the year. Okay, now then finally we come to the last section, right? <laughs> the application of roller compacted concrete, I am not going to details. The, the, so this was, this was carried out in 2002, so very old one, right? So by uh, Tusha Anikinan recorder, now he is a lecturer at, uh, he got his PhD also, now he is a lecturer at uh, Jawadhanapura. So the, the key finding or the proposal, key proposal, in this research was the evaluation of wet concrete density under the action of vibrating roller. In roller compacting concrete, the concrete is compacted by vibrating roller. There is a self weight and the vibration. Two actions are there. So, when you evaluate in the properties, especially the flexural strength and the weight density, we have to simulate the action of the vibrating roller. So you know that the VB, the conventional VB test measure the workability of very stiff mixer, so zero slump mix under vibration. The behavior of the zero slump mix under vibration so we modified that one, applied a weight to simulate the weight of the uh, roller, uh, vibrating roller, and this is what we got. So weight density variation, there's optimum value uh, with respect to the water content, and that depends on the cement content. The flexural strength is also same, right? And we observe that using fry ash, we can improve the compactability, right? So based on this one, we propose a mixed design procedure. Now, the next one is connected to this. Now, this I carried out with uh, 
Praise the Mampe Arachi for his, one of his MSc student research. Experimental investigation of load trans efficiency in relation to crack width of non double joints in concrete payments. Now, all these concrete payments, even the roller compacted concrete payments, are having joints, having joints, and some, uh, if it is concrete roads, you can have a, a double. But especially in case of the roller compacted, you cannot have a double, right? So you have to cut, uh, uh, make it weaken, and make sure that the crack go through that weakest point. So the performance of jointed concrete payments depend on so many factors. So the payment thickness is important, joint spacing is important. Joint spacing depends on the load transfer mechanism. Load transfer mechanism is either by double bars or by uh, aggregate interlocking. So non-double joint means the load transfer between the two payments at the joint transfer the load from one payment to the other one through the aggregate interlocking. So the so why we need the joints to prevent unplanned cracks? So it can be a sawn or groove contraction joint. The load trans efficiency is defined like this. The deflection or deformation on the loaded side and unloaded side. And that difference, the ratio depends on the, the properties of the joint. That means the maximum size of the aggregate, type of aggregate and the crack width. So we did an experiment investigation to find out the load trans mechanism with respect to the crack width because to come up with a joint spacing we must know the what should be the design crack width for a particular uh, load transfer efficiency. So I feel this is also I mean the first time this kind of experiment was carried out. So this was done in the structures lab strong flow. The, the concrete slab was cast and was placed on a rubber pad so that it can deform and this instrumentation applied the load by a load cell and monitor the deformation of the two edges, the two sides of the crack using transducer. So this is the outcome. So if you know the required load trans efficiency, for example 60, then you know the, what should be the crack width, right? So for that permissible crack width, we can calculate the joint spacing. Joint spacing, there's a joint Crack width is equal to the deformation due to the temperature vari variation and uh, the variation due to the shrinkage. The so with this one, you can come up with the joint spacing. Okay, the next is the self-healing Priyan mentioned this one. I consider this as a fundamental research but important research and this indicates that we are, you, you don't need a sophisticated instruments to measure or do research even the basic ones, basic research, right? So autogenous healing or self-healing of cracks is very, very important in case of water retaining structures. So if you get a crack, 
in a water retaining structure, definite water will pass through that after some time you will see the crack gets sealed, right? So I don't know whether Priyan can remember, I, this, I think this was done in the early 90s. I asked this one, why Priyan, there is a limit but no other restrictions. Right? I couldn't find any references to find out why the crack width is limited to a particular value without referring to any other requirements. So I thought of, okay, why not study it by myself, right? So the, it's a very simple uh, test that we did. Uh, a cylinder was split into two and jointed together to form a, a crack with a known crack width and jointed with a steel strap and sealed the two edges and connected this one to a constant head water supply. Allow the water to pass through and measure the what is coming out from this one. This is what we got, right? We can see the depression of the white deposit, that is the calcium hydroxide comes out and then that react with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and deposited as the insoluble calcium carbon. So this is a Variation, the, the flow rate variation with time, without any intervention, we observe the reduction in flow rate coming out from the specimen. Why? So that is due to the blocking of the crack path by deposition of the calcium carbon. The, you can see here, the bucket that we used to collect the water, there also you can see the white deposit, that means the entire calcium hydroxide leach out will not uh, convert to the calcium carbonate, certain amount comes out, certain amount get deposited. So I, I, didn't, I didn't go into the cement chemistry, calcium hydroxide is a product of hydration of calcium, uh, tricalcium silicate and dicalcium silicate. So calcium hydroxide you get in the hydrated cement phase, which is a soluble compound, right? So, and here we observe th there's optimum crack width at which the optimum crack width at which the crack gets sealed with minimum time. And that depends on the pressure gradient. So the self-healing depends on the pressure gradient, which was not stated in BS 8007 at that time. Not because of our research in EC2, now it is a function of pressure gradient. Now it is a function of pressure gradient, right? So, this is a good, you know, research that to pass the message that you can do fundamental studies even without using very sophisticated instruments. Now, this is a, the prediction of, uh, this is also very old one, more than 20 years old, but I want to present this one due to two cases. One is, I mean, this is uh, the person who did this one, is uh, Suranga Dizillo, he must be joining from overseas. When he came and asked me for a research project for his EC, uh, the engineering council exam, uh, the, I think, part two, there's a research project that is complete. So I gave this one, right, the Okay, to study on the prediction of compressive strength with early age. You don't need to wait for 28, I mean, uh, 
if you can predict it early age, you know exactly if there are problems with the strength development. So, use the the equivalent uh, age method, which is not new, but as a the byproduct of this project, we managed to produce this curve. That is the relationship between the compressive strength and the water cement ratio that normally we use uh, in the DOE method, the mixed design method that we popularly known as DOE method. So we have this graph given in the DOE. We happily use this one whether it is applicable or not, this doesn't matter and then we adjust that part, right? But we can produce this if you analyze the strength that you all have right in batch implants and come up with the most suitable the uh, set of graphs to predict the this strength with respect to given water cement ratio. The, the other good, I mean, important thing here I want to, so after getting through this council exam, he managed to obtain, he's an NDT person, he's a, a qualified with NDT, so that he had a barrier to, for his professional development. So, with this one, he managed to obtain associate membership of IESL and then finally he did a MSc in environmental engineering. Now he is working as a UNICEF, as an international professional. So the message that I want to pass is whenever is there is a person who needs some assistance, don't hesitate to give that assistance for him to uh, advance his career or any other, even the higher studies. Okay, so the predicting the, so this is much more complicated one than that. So I have presented this one because for this one, this uh, Amila, now he is a doctor, Amila Jayasinghe. He did a uh, uh, PhD at Cambridge. The much more sophisticated one, here, yeah, the degree of hydration was used to predict the strength with respect to early age and combine the Maikawa model for heat of hydration, this which was uh, adopted by uh, Maharachi, or uh, not Maharachi, Matararachi, right? So using that one, he managed to predict the temperature rise. So this is an INC funded project. The, this one is also that I want to highlight. The person is here, Dr. Gobidas. This is his final year project. Now still I feel that there is some value in this project. So now there are so many commercially available sensors to predict the corrosion, like Raupach corrosion ladder. Right? Now here I want to use a simple method that is the change of resistance of a steel strip. Change the resistance of a steel strip to evaluate the corrosive condition of the concrete. So for the corrosion of reinforcement you require oxygen, moisture, maybe chloride will promote. So before reaching the reinforcement, if you can predict the combination of that one, whether it is uh, the right condition for corrosion, then you can take precautionary action, right? So, but I mean, the challenging part is the measuring the change in resistance that is in micro ohm sometimes it can be in nano ohm so and also we have to make it a wireless eh? so using a wireless network one can monitor this one 
So still, I think I'm pushing Gobi to complete this project. Okay, so the close. Eh? The this is another important one: pile cap cracking of Southern Highway project. So when you see this one, I don't think that's a I mean, don't get panic. Still, you can use this Southern Highway. It is severely cracked, right? Severely cracked. So it was, and this kind of cracking you can see in another project that is Sena Naika Samudra, similar crack pattern below the water level. That is inside water, it, concrete has cracked. So the crack pattern is map cracking, like the, what we observe in pile caps. So altogether, 11 pile caps have exhibited and some are very severe. And the few things that I want to highlight, the grade 30 concrete was used with Portland limestone cement and the manufactured sand and only continuously wet or dry piles have been cracked. So there were cases where the, even under that conditions there were some piles were not cracked. So crack pattern was map cracking. Why concrete crack underwater? Normally concrete crack when it shrinks. That is the common phenomenon. But this happens when the this cracking has taken place. Do, when the concrete is wet. So so to have cracking when concrete to crack under wet condition it should expand. It should expand. So what are the expansive reactions? Sulfate attack, alkali silica reaction, alkali carbonate reaction, and the last one is entering, delayed entering jet formation. So in short, we call it DEF. So at this time, DEF term was new to the construction industry. It is like tsunami. When the tsunami came, people were not aware about the tsunami. Like tsunami, even this was not aware by the construction industry, right? DEF. So, carried out experimental investigation. I will quick go through. No point uh, uh, spending time on that one. The the. So we, are, we have carried out to exclude the alkali silica reaction, right? So extracted aggregate from the co-samples from the pile, uh, affected pile caps and we found there's no sulfates in the soil or groundwater. So we can eliminate that one. No reactive silica in the aggregate. We can uh, eliminate that one. So alkali carbonate reaction because we use limestone powder in cement. So that was eliminated. So only possible one was the delayed heterogeneous formation. So what are the factors influencing this phenomenon? There are several factors, but two are important. That is, the one is if the concrete subjected to very high temperature at early age, that means 70 degrees, the, the researchers agree this temperature limits and the moisture, there should be moisture. Even if the concrete is subjected to very high temperature, if there is no moisture during the lifespan of the structure, this will not happen, right? So. And in this project, I think the temperature was not controlled and the limiting value was not specified. So there were no records with respect to temperature rise. And we use our, the multi-component heat hydration model to predict the temperature, expected temperature based on the 
cement composition and the mixed proportions and we found that these values for the 800 millimeter and 1400 so there is a possibility to crack due to DEF because the, we suspect the those fire caps were subjected to a temperature beyond 70 at early age. So, uh, again, the formation of a tringite is the normal reaction when the tricalcium aluminate react with calcium sulfate and produce a tringite. Now, that is an expansive reaction that is happening at very early stage. So even if the expansion is taking place at very early stage, that will not have any detrimental effect. Problem is, when it happens, once the concrete has hardened. So the mo normal reaction is a tringite converts to monosulfate hydrate. So when the temperature is high, a tringite decomposes and releases sulfate ion. And when the temperature drops, later on this monosulfate hybrid combined with sulfate and produce a tringite. And this is an expansive reaction taking place once the concrete has hardened. So the sulfates are within the concrete and this is due to the heat generated. So therefore this is called heat induced internal sulfate attack. So, so this is happening in the paste phase, so therefore you will get the paste expands, you get a gap created around the range for the aggregate and this uh, gap get filled with this etringite and when you look at through the, the microscope, optical microscope, even op the optical microscope you can see uh, white rim around the aggregate and if you look uh, observe through the scanning electron microscope you can clearly identify the deposition of a tringite along the uh, crack. Okay, so that was confirmed. The, the samples were sent to Japan to verify using a CM and so based on the test results, it was confirmed that the cracking is mainly due to the formation of EF. The, we did further studies to find out the effect of fly ash and effect of the limestone powder. This was carried out in Japan the, with uh, Saitama University with Professor Asamoto and I'm not, now there's accelerated test, accelerated test that we can carry out to check the expansion and this graph shows the, the performance of these samples we tested. Uh, the under the in cured in water, right, immerse in uh, water with uh, carbonate ion, that is to prevent the leaching of calcium carbonate. So three types of mixers were used. HPC is high early strength cement, there you get high tricalcium silicate, and then HPC plus 15% limestone, and the HPC plus 25% limestone. So this is the vertical axis the expansion. So you can see that how effective the fly ash is to suppress the expansion. OPC is also vulnerable and if we have uh, the limestone powder that is the worst case. So that is the case uh, in uh, Southern Highway. So that is more vulnerable for the dilated tringite formation. Okay, the good news is the 
last one past five fire performance of prefabricated cellular lightweight concrete i must uh, show this slide at least one slide here now there's a the the research group fire research group at Japura, Professor Konta Singh uh, and uh, the who is the other guy uh, at Northumbria University. Uh, Chaminda? Kirtan, sorry, <laughs> I forgot his name. Kirtan and so this group is doing uh, research on fire and we want to develop a furnace to carry out the research especially with this one so when we search we found a one company called Lanka Refractories Limited that was established long time ago to produce fire bricks for the cement factories and also for the steel corporation so they were planning to uh, establish uh, arc furnace so they are producing fire bricks and also they are producing some incinerators for the uh, hospitals hmm, to burn the hazardous uh, uh, waste so we contacted them and gave this idea to fabricate this furnace it's a fairly large furnace to carry out the Irindu's research work his PhD research work right so they are he has to test lightweight panels uh, and measure the temperature distribution across the thickness and this the fire load that he has to apply is specified now that is called ISO fire uh, temperature curve fire load it has a particular red uh, so you cannot apply the the fire load at a different rates you have to follow the ISO fire rate curve and these people managed to fabricate and control the temperature inside the furnace to match the ISO fire curve these are the initial trials and this is the final one right so I think this is the only furnace available in Sri Lanka which can control the temperature according to the ISO standard and can be test a large panel one by one I think they had the plans to go for a bigger one now this is a good example that there are things that we can develop locally if we try to get this one from a foreign country it will cost millions and billions uh, impossible so here I don't think that it cost uh, I think very very small amount how much it was it 2.5 yeah, the commercial available one is about more than 30, more than 30. so see the, uh, the what we can do with the, the experts in Sri Lanka and it is a matter of putting our ideas together and implementing it so the the determination and the willing to explore and willing to produce is the most important thing so the next one is again connected to this one what is our 
future of this construction industry. The construction industry cannot survive if you stick to the old-fashioned technology. We have to move and adapt the latest technology like virtual reality drone, survey, BI, BIM, already I think some companies are using that one, 3D printing, future, I think we must, I think the, the, the buildings will be printed and the automation of the construction process. Have you thought about that one? Huh? It is always we try to do manually, right? So that is where that research and innovation must concentrate. So this is the one good example that one construction company has taken a bold decision to go for this kind of construction. That is called volumetric, uh, prefabricated, pre-finished volumetric construction, PPVC. So in other words, a modular construction. It is not just a module, the everything, the, all the finishes are done at the factory and it is a matter of going and just assembling it. So this is the first ever modular building constructed in Sri Lanka by ICC. The two gentlemen are here. So they took a very bold decision to go for this construction technology, to introduce this modular construction to the uh, local construction industry. There is a huge potential and so the next step I am sure will be the medium rise and then the high rise. So step by step that we must try to achieve that one and this is in-house development. So except the mold, everything from architecture to structural, all were done by local engineers, local uh, technicians and the local staff in the ICC. So I must congratulate ICC for going for this one. Uh, and so unless we explore the new things, our construction industry will stagnate and somebody else will come and take over that, right? Okay, so that is my end of my presentation, but as a formality, what? I have to thank, there are so many people that I have to thank. So, sorry I took nearly half an hour more, the, so two schools I attended, St. John's College Nugegoda and Royal College Colombo. So I want to take a moment to express my half gratitude to these two schools as well as the two great universities, the University of Moratua and the Tokyo University. And I must thank my mentor and the person who introduced a research call to the department, Professor Chandrakirti. So he was my teacher and the supervisor, research supervisor, and he's the one that encouraged me to do research in concrete. Of course, the, the research I did with him was in masonry, right? So, and Priyan, I want to thank you, Priyan. So, you are, I, I always had a very intellectual discussions with you. Uh, 
not not rubbish but always the discussion is something uh, intellectual something concrete or something related to structures the then to my two supervisors professor komura and professor maika they are the people who molded me as a researcher and then my co-workers dozawa and sobnuk they are all professors and recently uh, professor azamoto join with me to do some research he help a lot and my parents my late parents the and three sisters and brother two are not living with us so i must uh, the i want to express my profound gratitude to my late parents and my three sisters and brother for their unwavering love and unconditional support throughout my life they encouragement and belief in me and been the foundation of my journey i carry their memory with me in all that i do and i am deeply thankful for the values and strength they instill in me so thank you all the last the last slide is something else not technical in my i, I uh, in my finally that was in 1981 i did my research project in masonry i did another research project and i did another research project during my final year and the final result was this <laughs> i found my uh, life partner dambika exactly on 7th july that was the day <laughs> she gave okay that was the day that she gave okay and we got married 25th september then few weeks later we went to japan and my son was born on 13th september 1990 as you all know he entered the moratua and did civil engineering now he is working as a civil engineer so the finally i must acknowledge the unwavering support of my wife damika and my son kushan who have been by my side throughout my career taking care of me and providing the love and encouragement that have sustained have sustained me so so thank you very much believe in me and giving the support throughout our life i think we have celebrated 30 odd years of uh, marriage life together finally the moratua serving this institution for more than four decades has been an incredible honor and privilege as i step into retirement i do so with deep sense of fulfillment thank you all for listening to me my lengthy presentation without leaving thank you thank you thank you very much sir for that enlightening lecture although you took more than the allocated time it was truly beneficial for all of us and your profound insights and dedication to this field have been truly inspiring i am sure it has brought so many memories back to both your family colleagues and also students like us ladies and gentlemen before we proceed further let us take a moment to delve 
into the life journey of Professor Anurana Narayakar. Through this video presentation, we will have the opportunity to witness the milestones, achievements and memorable moments that have shaped his career and left an enduring legacy within the University of Morotu. For over four decades, the University of Moratua has been home to one of its most dedicated and inspiring pillars, Professor Anur Anayakar. Let us take a moment to reflect on the remarkable journey of this exceptional educator, researcher and mentor. Born on March 10, 1958 in Colombo, Professor Anur Anayakar laid the foundation for his academic brilliance at St. John's College New Guinea and later at Royal College Colombo. His exceptional academic journey continued as he joined covered by the campus of the University of Sri Lanka in 1977, eventually graduating from the University of Mortua in 1982. Soon after graduation, he joined the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Mortua as an assistant lecturer. In 1985, he was awarded the prestigious Momosha Scholarship, preparing him to the University of Tokyo, Japan, where he completed his Master of Engineering and Doctor of Engineering degrees under the guidance of Dr. Koishi Makawa and Professor Hajime. the principle of structural mechanics and measured parameters related to concrete durability. In 1999, Prof. Anunana Kara's dedication to advancing his field led him to secure the prestigious Association of International Education, Japan, Research Fellowship, granting him the opportunity to revisit the University of Tokyo as a distinguished research fellow. During his time there, he delved deeper into the realm of concrete technology, fostering international collaborations and expanding his research horizons. His pursuit of excellence continued to flourish as he was honoured with the Commonwealth Academy Fellowship to the esteemed Imperial College of London in 2004. During his tenure, he immersed himself in an intellectually stimulating environment, collaborating with leading experts and scholars in the field. Professor Nanakara's research is in the area of concrete technology, focusing on the use of alternative equations used in making of concrete, mitigation of early age thermal cracking, and durability of concrete. The research carried out by Professor Nanakara and his collaborators has impacted the Sri Lankan construction industry significantly. The use of offshore sand as an alternative to river sand, the use of fly ash and concrete, both to utilize a waste material and to improve concrete durability and the mitigation of plastic shrinkage cracking in ready mixed concrete pores have all been driven by their research. His research collaboration with National Building Research Organization led to the patent on a highly permeable and energy-absorbing paving block 
made from polyester spandex fabric waste, where he is one of the three inventors. He is the recipient of many awards for his outstanding contribution to the industry and the profession of structural engineering, which includes the President's Award for his scientific research contribution in 2010 and 2017. Recognized for his expertise and vision, Rosanna Kara collaborated with the National Building Research Organization and other industry partners, offering his insights and guidance to prepare research endeavors. His profound contributions to the development of national standards and the model code for concrete in Asia stand as testimonies for his enduring dedication to advance in the field. After a service of 16 years as a senior lecturer, Dr. Nana Kara was promoted to professor in 2006 and senior professor eight years thereafter. Senior Professor Nana Kara served as the head of the department of the civil engineering department from 2013 to 2016. During this period, he was also required to act as the dean of faculty of engineering on four occasions. Further, he served as the competent authority of the Institute of Technology of the University of Moldova from July to September in 2020. As the head of the Department of Civil Engineering, Rasanana Kaya's visionary leadership brought about significant milestones, including securing full accreditation from the Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka for the department's undergraduate degree. His establishment of long-term agreements with prominent organizations such as Hall Sri Lanka Private Limited and Silong Steel Corporation Limited underscore his commitment to fostering academic excellence and supporting students' academic endeavors. Despite his remarkable professional achievement, Professor Nanakara's warmth and compassion endeared him to students and colleagues alike. <laughs> So, as we continue to honor Professor Nanak Kara, it is with immense pleasure that we present him with a souvenir book containing heartfelt wishes from his teachers, family, colleagues, industry personnel, and grateful students. This book serves as a token of our appreciation and gratitude for his invaluable contributions and a heartfelt note on the positive impact he had in shaping our lives. So let me invite uh, Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, Professor Ajit De Alvis, uh, to present this souvenir. And I cordially invite Professor Nanakar on the podium as well.
Thank you very much, sir. Right. I extend my sincere gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us today physically as well as through Zoom to celebrate the illustrious career of Professor Anurana Anakkar. Your presence here is a testament to the profound impact he had on all of our lives. First and foremost, I would like to express our deep appreciation to Professor Anurana Anakkar for sharing your invaluable experiences with us as you bid farewell to this institution. I would also like to extend a special word of thanks to Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, Prof. Ajit Dialvis, for gracing this occasion. Next, my sincere thank goes to Prof. Chinta Jayasinghe, Head Department of Civil Engineering, and all the senior staff members of the department as well as the university who wholeheartedly rendered their support to make this event a success. And special thank goes to Madam Dhammika Nanayakara, who provided us with all the nitty gritty details of Sir, which went into that nice video and the souvenir. Dear invited guests from the academia and industry, your physical presence here today elevated this occasion to another level. Thank you very much for your time and effort to be here amidst your busy schedules. My deep appreciation for all the academic and non-academic staff members of the University of Morocco as well as the Civil Engineering Department for their unwavering support to make this event a reality. I would also like to thank Faculty of Graduate Studies for lending us this Zoom room and providing us with all the facilities today. Special thank goes to Mr. Sanjay and uh, the team from the audiovisual unit and Mr. Nadisha from CITES for your invaluable contributions to broadcast this event globally. My sincere thank goes to the official photographer from the University Library for capturing this special occasion. I would also like to extend a special word of thanks to Mr. Chamir Randil, who was the main person behind all these wonderful graphic designs. And a special thank goes to the video and graphic design team, Utpala Lokuge, Dulanji Toradeniya, Nipun Vimala Surya, Ashen Karyavasam, Ginet Punjiheva, Madhu Shabevardhana, Agra Navaratna, Imesh Kumar Singh and Nipun Kalwarachi. Thank you all for an amazing job. And I would also like to thank former students of Professor Nanakkara who were behind this event from the very beginning. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the people who are joining with us from all around the globe via Zoom, family, friends, past students, current students, colleagues, industry partners, and well-wishers. We really appreciate your presence and uh, it proves the positive impact Professor Nanakkar had on society at large. So let us continue to uphold his legacy and carry forward his teachings and values in our pursuit of knowledge and excellence. Thank you and have a wonderful day. I cordially invite all for some refreshments as well.